I, at this moment, I'm going to call on our SAMSA board chair, Ms. Ndato Minyugu. She will come I'm in and introduce our Honorable Minister our of Transport, Mr. Figile Balula. Ms. Ndato, you can take over. Our Honorable Minister of Transport, Mr. Figile Balula. Ms. Ndato, you can take over. Our Honorable Minister of Transport, Mr. Figile Balula. A board chairperson, you can take over. Uh, board chairperson, you have the floor. Uh, board chairperson, you have the floor. Uh, uh, Miss Minugo, you are still uh, muted. Uh, Miss Minugo, you are still uh, muted. Ms. Minugo, you are still uh, muted. Ms. Minugo, you are still uh, muted. Uh, welcome, uh, board chair, Ms. Um, Dato Minugo. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence this morning. Uh, welcome, uh, I will hand over to you as you introduce Dr. our Honorable Dr. Minister of Transport. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence this morning. Uh, welcome, uh, I will hand over to you as you introduce Dr. our Honorable Dr. Minister of Transport. Thank you so much, Thank you so much uh, uh, this morning. Um, Chairperson of the session. I hope my audio is fine. Thank there have so been much, some uh, audio issues with the videos. But uh, in introducing the minister, I hope my audience uh, fine. we're noting that we today is the 11th anniversary of the International the Day of the Seafarer, but, uh, and it is my honor to be part of these proceedings, which is being celebrated all across the world by IMO member states. The 2021 theme of a fair future for seafarers speaks to the invaluable role that seafarers play in the current and future outlook for the industry, as been, has been shared by pre, in the previous video. We all know that, that seafarers are the bloodline of global trade and contribute to the heartbeat of South Africa's economy, with 90% of global cargo being delivered by sea and transported by ships. It is clear that we need skilled seafarers to operate, maintain, and repair these ships. By celebrating the Day of the Seafarer, the general public can become aware of the role that seafarers play in their daily lives and why they are so fundamental in determining the prosperity of both the national and global economy. Reflecting on issues facing seafarers is particularly poignant as we South Africans close off Youth Month, which has shown troubling trends in youth joblessness rates due to narrowing employment opportunities for young people, including maritime cadets. It also comes at a time when we are striving as a country to navigate and deliver a vaccine rollout program through the third wave of COVID-19, which since early 2021, early 2020 has disrupt, disrupted the global maritime industry. Developing national resilience to the COVID-19 pandemic through the vaccination rollout segues into discussions on the general welfare and working conditions conditions of essential and frontline workers, such as seafarers, who continue to play an invaluable role keeping our economies flowing and alive, and alive during the pandemic. On that, on that note, it is my honor to welcome Honorable Minister Fikile Mbalula, our Minister of Transport in the Sixth Democratic Administration of South Africa. He is the man that the President has tasked to have his hands on deck, working tirelessly to drive economic recovery and catalyze the investment potential of the transport sector. With these few words, I invite the minister to share his keynote address, uh, which will speak to the significance of the day, as well as an update on South Africa's COVID-19 regulations for maritime transport. Seafarers, ladies and gentlemen, I pre present to you none other than Honorable Minister Fikile Mbalula, Member of Parliament. Seafarers, ladies and gentlemen, I pre present to you none other than Honorable Minister Fikile Mbalula, Member of Parliament. Seafarers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Thank you, Chair of the Board uh, of uh, SAMSA. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Seafarers. Thank you, Chair of 
it is an honor and privilege for me uh, to be part of the commemoration of the day of the CIFARA 2021 under the theme Fair to be part Future for CIFARAs. The Republic of South Africa is a member state of the International Future Maritime Organization, IMO, and custodian of the Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping Convention. As a member state, South Africa has traditionally supported and participated in the CIFARAS Day celebration on 25 June. The purpose of this day is to recognize the unique contribution made by CIFARAS from all over the world uh, to international seaborne trade, the world economy and civil society as a whole. In 2010, the IMO designated 25 June as the International Day of the CIFARAS as a way to recognize that almost everything that we use in our daily life has been directly or indirectly affected by sea transport. International shipping moves more than 90% of global trade to peoples and communities all over the world, and about 20 million containers are transported across the oceans every day. The resolution to celebrate the day of the seafarer is intended to create awareness about the unique role of seafarers and to recognize the contribution they make all over the world to international seaborne trade, the world economy and civil society as a whole. This year, our aim is to discuss the intervention put in place to alleviate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on seafarers. This includes the difficult working conditions due to the pandemic, unemployment, crew changes, repatriation, fair treatment of seafarers and fair working conditions in line with maritime labor convention. South Africa has ratified the Maritime Labor Convention, which advocates for basic rights or fair conditions of living at sea. We have had the call by IMO to designate seafarers as essential workers through the following intervention. Crew change is allowed within the stringent COVID-19 protocols. South African commercial ports are operating at 100% for imports and exports. Accommodation establishments are open to seafarers. We are working closely with foreign missions in facilitating the movement of seafarers through the Maritime Rescue and Coordination Center. We have also developed regulations to support and protect the rights of seafarers. The Comprehensive Maritime Transport Policy 2017 is also a developmental tool that seeks to advance the call by promoting continuous engagement with ship owners and operators to promote the implementation of the MMC. We are short of our support towards the sustainable development of seafarers into the future. With those words, I wish you all a fruitful and successful commemoration of the International Day of the Seafarer. I thank you. I wish you all a fruitful and successful commemoration of the International Day of the Seafarer. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister for those words that give us hope that our government in South Africa cares and Thank has you, put Honorable a lot of measures in place to ensure the well-being of our seafarers. In South Africa cares At this time, put a lot of measures uh, I'd like to apologize to once again of our because we are having serious issues with our uh, technology.
We apologize that the chat function on our Teams platform seems to be disabled. We are working on getting it back on. But in the meantime, we are also live on Facebook, and you are welcome to engage us on the chat function there. We apologize profusely for this inconvenience. At this time, we had prepared uh, videos from seafarers themselves who are going to share their experiences. But At due to time, our difficulties, we, uh, we will uh, play the videos towards the end of our program. But so at this time, I will call upon uh, our acting DDG, Mr. Mtunzi Madia, from the Department of Transport. So at this time, I will call upon our acting DDG, Mr. Mtunzi Madia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, or call uh, Program Director. And um, uh, good Good morning, uh, Honorable yeah, Minister, much, uh, the Chair of the Board, the seafarers, and um, they are the reason why we are here morning, today. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, the Chair of the Board, I think uh, <coughs> the we, we as a, as a, a Department of Transport, been tasked I think, uh, uh, to articulate we, the government's role a, and commitment a, to South African seafarers. South African government uh, uh, subscribed uh, first and foremost to the fact that seafarers are essential workers and they require to be treated as such. South Africa as a maritime nation will subscribe to the ideas, rules, regulations, conventions of the International Maritime Organization. Will subscribe to and and today's main objective, ladies and gentlemen, is to celebrate the Day of the Seafarer. And it is intended to create the awareness among other things. We need to promote this day to make sure that our seafarers are, are taken care of and then we support them as, 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 as the Department of Transport. I think, ladies and gentlemen, the theme says it all. Fair future for the seafarers, especially in this context of the COVID-19. I think, ladies and gentlemen, the theme. So, government um, therefore aims to, to look at the conditions under which these men and women work under. So and also make sure that we implement all, all the conditions to make sure that we assist, and also as the Honorable Minister has articulated, with the crew change. We repatriate um, 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 the seafarers sure that needs to get out of the, the country for, for medical reasons change. and otherwise. And ladies and gentlemen, and, I think uh, from as far as our level five for, for um, uh, in the otherwise. country, we started to open up and all the ports. In fact, it's only two ports that were not uh, allowed to do the crew change. The it was the port of Saldana as well, well as the port of Mosin Bay. And then that was even due to the fact that we were trying to the port of Saldana, to preserve uh, the resources, the especially for and then that was for immigration official, they, 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 they could not be um, um, uh, deployed the on those two ports because uh, the port of, of Cape Town was a central point in terms of the crew change. So we had to um, uh, to work smartly in terms of a distribution of resources. So we had to. Generally, all the supporting initiatives that are seeking to evaluate the plight of these men and women are being implemented. <coughs> Government, therefore, especially the Department of Transport, will continue to develop all the necessary regulations to support the seafarer, especially under these uh, trying uh, circumstances and conditions, improve the standard of education and training. This is in twofold. We need to actually improve and upgrade and upskill the current seafarer so that they can be able to cope uh, with international demands and expectations. Secondly, through South African Maritime Safety Authority, we need to make sure that the standard of training in our institutions is monitored and audited so that our STCWU as regime is not compromised. I, 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 I personally think um, uh, we, we need um, to put out our game 
and to make sure that we up our games in terms of vaccinating of the separates. We need we ought to have done far better in terms of coordinating that aspect of the welfare of the seafarers. And I challenge the Department, South African Maritime Safety Authority, the private sector in the maritime value chain to develop strategies with regards to this matter so that we can be able um, we can be able to assist our seafarers um, that they require the vaccination, more so if we then say our seafarers are essential workers. I think we need to do a better coordination acting CEO to make sure that we are able to respond um, um, uh, to this challenge. I think, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will have a uh, discussion uh, with, the, with the panelists in various uh, uh, issues pertaining this uh, important uh, day that we are commemorating, and then we'll be able to have a uh, discussion. Thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Program Director. Uh, back to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Thank you, Acting DDG, Mr. Madia. At this point, we'd we'll like to call on Mr. Chi. Thank you, Mr. Chi, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chi, for joining us. Your presentation will be up just now. Thank you, Mr. Chi, for joining us. Your presentation will be up just now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, good morning, Honorable Minister, Chair of Board. Seafarers and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, uh, I would like to share a presentation on a true change vaccination and seafarer welfare in Singapore amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I, this, uh, this portion I will share about the designation of seafarers as a key workers and crew change and vaccination effort. Yeah, okay, we uh, go to the next slide. Yeah. This, uh, this portion I will share about the designation of seafarers. Okay, rec recognizing what the vital role of our seafarers uh, player in keeping uh, our global supply chain running, Singapore was one of the co sponsors of the UNGA paper and has taken concrete steps to resolve the crew change crisis and ensure our maritime frontline workers, including non Singaporeans working in our port waters, receive priority vaccination. Hence, Singapore has been facilitating crew change despite wider border restrictions since 27 March 2020. We have been working closely with uh, industry union partners. Despite to establish a crew change corridor to facilitate crew change in a safe environment. Since March 2020, uh, Singapore has facilitated more than 140,000 cases of crew change sign on and sign off. And more than uh, of which 140,000 uh, are foreign seafarers. That's almost 100% and these numbers are accurate as of June. Our crew change efforts are balanced between minimizing risk of local public health and keeping the global chain supply chain going. We constantly uh, uh, review our policy and processes in line with the development of the pandemic. Unfortunately, due to the recent surge in case in cases around the world and at home, we have made adjustments to our crew change measure as seen in the following port circular. The marine port circular number 14, crew change of cargo ships, where we uh, require the stay home notice, SHN, from 14 days back to serving 21 days. We hope the situation in these countries will improve and at such time we will review our measures again. Okay, meanwhile, for seafarers who are eligible 
for crew change, they will go through this bubble wrap. So Singapore have a crew change uh, safe corridor. We adopt this okay, a safe corridor in, uh, for crew change in Singapore. Change it's a bubble wrap concept where sign on, sign off will go through a direct ship plane or plane ship transfer. They are subjected to a various pre departure requirement and sign off requirement, which you can see from the slide. What is reflected on the slide is the latest set of requirement on our crew change regime. Crew change facilitation require collaboration of efforts, not only on the local fronts, but on international level if required. Singapore has established the SG Staff Fund, which is called a Singapore Shipping Tripartite Alliance Resilient Fund. The, SG staff the first ground-up tripartite initiative which comprises of the MPA, Shipping, Singapore Shipping Alliance, Association, Singapore, Singapore Maritime Officer Union, SMOU, and Singapore Organization of Seamen, SOS. MPA, Alongside international partners including ITF, Officer, the International Maritime Employers Council, IMAC, and the International Seaman. Chamber of Shipping to work with stakeholders in shipping nation on concrete solutions for safe crew change starting with Philippines. The staff fund is recently joined with support from more international organizations such as Global Maritime Forum, Global Maritime Forum, Maritime Industry Crew Change Task Force, Intertanko, Norwegian Shipping Association, World Shipping Council as well as seven port authorities from uh, Abu Dhabi, Antwerp, Barcelona, Norwegian Hamburg, Rotterdam, Sinus, and Vancouver. You can go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the staff, the SG staff fund currently uh, amount to around Singapore dollars 2 million. Two not initiative uh, under SD staff fund is crew safe audit uh, program and enhance facility and capabilities to establish to safe and scalable corridor to enable crew change from home country program. or country of origin and to the country where the crew joins the ships safe facilitate safe holding facility at the home or origin country and the country where the crew change occur such as the accreditation of the quarantine and isolation facilities covid-19 pcr testing certification and white listing of clinics for pcr testing the second one is a creating digital solutions for tracking crew change the second one is a creating digital solutions. Okay, uh, a quick look at the crew safe audit program. We have uh, four steps here. The first, the, the first one is a using plan, do, check methodology, uh, facility operate, program, establish uh, procedure and plan specifically enhance to handle situation associated with the pandemic. They will be guided with a self-assessment checklist. And after the initial audit, there will be a follow-up audit within five weeks. On the right side of the, of the slide, uh, you can see a list of accredited facilities, which uh, now we have in the uh, Philippines, mainly in Manila, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. And uh, as this staff task force look forward to welcoming more facilities in growing supplying countries to join the program. And so far, uh, the latest one, we also have a uh, aggregated sum in the Mamba. Okay, the, the trial the has been conducted for dig digital solutions. Digital solutions support companies and crew throughout the process, commencing from the 21 days of self-isolation in your country of origin and the strengthen the compliance to the standard equivalent to the Singapore Ministry of Health, Health Advisory for Person Issue a State Home Notice. And the SG Staff Fund have shortlisted two digital solution provider, namely Kaha and Whitex, to provide wearable digital solutions that support and enhance overseas crew change process, such as quarantine and health monitoring. Both solutions are provided through Kaha, smart wearable technology, where companies can have better insurance in ensuring the sea parents have to adhere to their quarantine requirements in their home countries before leaving for Singapore's crew solution. The trial was successfully concluded with more than 170 sea parents in their home countries and using the wearable Singapore's crew change. 
the trial was successfully concluded with more than Singapore is one of the first countries participating in using to prioritize vaccination for frontline maritime personnel, including seafarers, in our national vaccination program under state sea air vaccination exercise since January 2021. There are two phases in our national vaccination program under state. Is for frontline workers, such as port workers, since January harbour pilots, they are cargo officers, marine surveyors, marine superintendents who are required to work on board a ship in our port. The second phase is for essential workers with little risk of exposure, such as marine movers, drivers who are required to work on board a ship in port terminals. The second phase is for essential workers. With More than 36,000 frontline and essential maritime uh, personnel have terminals. been vaccinated at least one dose under the state. With more than 31,000 frontline personnel, around 86 percent fully vaccinated at least one dose, which have completed under the state. With more than 31,000 personnel, also around 86 percent fully vaccinated regarding food change and vaccination program. Personnel in IMO member state through IMO circular letters. The SG staff is currently working on a protocol that could provide useful guidance on how a vaccination program is operationalized. Once ready, we will circulate through the IMO. The SG staff is currently working on a protocol that could provide useful guidance on how a vaccination program could be operationalized. Once ready, we will circulate through the IMO. Next, I would like to share an effort to support the welfare of seafarers. Next slide, please. Next, I would like to share an effort to support the welfare of seafarers relief package to assist Singaporean seafarers whose employment has been affected by border control measures and food change restrictions. MPA and Singapore Maritime Officer Union (SMOU) jointly jointly provided the seafarer relief package. Singaporean seafarers who are unable to secure seaport employment between 1st May 2020 to June 2021 may apply for up to $800 per month in financial assistance. The other one is the Achievement Award Scheme, where MPA and the Employment and Employability Institute E2I, SMOU and the Singapore Organization of Seamen, SOS, jointly provided a revised Achievement Award Scheme. The AA scheme complements the view on the momentum provided by the current scheme for both employees and employees. It rewarded eligible applicants up to $10,000 for successful completion of the requirements. The revised AA scheme encouraged the building of technical experience as senior officer on board to develop proficiency that are necessary to assume key roles, key shore roles such as marine and technical superintendents. General initiative for seafarers, one of increase to annual contribution to seafaring mission. MPA partners uh, such as uh, Mission to Seafarers, uh, we provide uh, uh, a one off uh, additional $50,000 uh, uh, grant on top of their $150,000. To, to the seafarer mission in Singapore. The annual grant support a wide range of well fair services for seafarers, including free counselling services and pastoral care, with which the seafarer mission have also made available online. The next one will be raising the next generation of seafarers. Uh, event of uh, event meet, amidst the challenges of ongoing pandemic, we must continue to think about how we can raise the next generation of seafarers. And in this regard, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation by sharing about C Singapore effort on this front. And in this regard, MPA works with seafaring uh, unions, SMOU, SOS, to organize regular networking events for our seafaring students and cadets. Example of our, for our cooperation is where we work with shipping companies, to features local seafarer in our various media profiling so that our audience, youth, parents, especially their parents, can identify with the story. It is also important to regularly do such engagement, especially in social media, so that we can reach out to our local youth about seafaring. The last one is the, we have a Trapatite Maritime Scholarship, which is called a TMNS. This uh, is a tripartite effort between the government, industry, which is a shipping company, and uh, unions, uh, seafaring unions, 
to attract the good students into the taking up seafaring as a career. And this TMS was launched in 2020, and uh, you can see from the slide there are some benefits uh, to the students that are uh, eligible for the scholarships. I have come to uh, the end of my presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, hope, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, hope, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chi, for your presentation and sharing your experiences from Singapore. Thank you, Mr. Chi. At this time, I'm going to call on Mrs. Soraya Adman, who is the Director of Operations at South African Sorry, International I Maritime Institute, Spahimi. She will be talking to us about skills development and employment creation within the maritime industry. Thank you, Program Director. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. And shortly, we will be streaming your presentation. It is on. It will just come through in a moment. We will be streaming your presentation. It is on. It will just come through in a moment. Good morning, Honorable uh, Minister, guests and seafarers. Um, today, we would like to chat to you about the Good National morning, Seafarer uh, Development Minister, Program, um, which provides a structured like uh, program for candidates to obtain their sea time through agreements program. with foreign and local shipping companies, enabling them to secure international recognized qualifications. During their time aboard the vessel, the seafarers are taught seamanship and safety culture, best practice, discipline, and work ethics, practical application of theory learned at university and college, and combine experience and research to complete assignments to gain practical ship maintenance. We aim University to improve the skills and increase and the number of South, uh, South African seafarers. Um, if you can go back one slide, we aim to improve the skills and increase the number of South African seafarers. Um, if you can go back, back one slide, slide back one more. Okay. The um, South African International Maritime back Institute one is funded by back one the. Okay. Department of the, Higher Education uh, via the National, National Skills Fund. Uh, Sahimi has been appointed the as the implementing agency for skills Department development and capacity building by the Department of Higher Education and Training. The Nat National um, Seafarer Development Program is one of our flagship um, training programs. Next, please. The National Seafarer Development Program is one of our flagship training programs. Next, please. Okay, our strategic objectives um, of Sahimi um, comprises of three main categories. The first one being skills education and training okay. programs, which we will focus on today. Um, as I mentioned before, the um, Department of Higher Education has uh, appointed Sahimi as the implementing agent. Our responsibility is to facilitate, coordinate and, uh, the maritime um, sector education and training programs. 
We also focused on research and development, which aims to promote and support research and development and innovation and to leverage our knowledge systems through co-creation of ideas solutions and development in all fields of the oceans and maritime economy. Lastly, sector development and advocacy. SAIMI plays an active role in the development of the maritime sector um, and the promotion thereof. Next slide, please. Today, however, I'm going to be focusing on skills education and training programs, um, which Today, however, Sahimi has undertaken um, to uh, address certain issues um, to raise the awareness of the oceans and careers at sea, also looking at skills, education and training capacity and development support. Next slide, please. Also looking at skills, education and training capacity. The Maritime Awareness Program is, inten uh, is intended to raise consciousness that South Africa is a maritime nation and we aim to grow participation in the ocean's economy and position South Africa as Africa's leading maritime nation by growing awareness of the opportunities for careers, employment, business and upliftment of communities. Next slide, please. Maritime nation. So we have launched um, a maritime awareness program which is aimed at creating awareness about the ocean's economy as its role in addressing the socio-economic challenges facing the country. The program is targeted at people from previously disadvantaged communities, learners, entrepreneurs, employees, SMMEs, unemployed youth and women. Maritime awareness is also key with the view of increasing throughput and um, reducing dropout rates at tertiary education level. Um, we've realized that it's important for awareness to be raised at a very young age so that learners can have an idea of what careers are available in the sector and prepare themselves for it as early as possible. We don't want learners to become aware of seagoing when they or seagoing careers when they are have already reached um, sea, um, tertiary stage. Can you go back one slide, please? Okay, so our aim is to um, create one more slide back, please. Okay, so our aim is so the Maritime Awareness Program is intended to raise awareness that um, South Africa is a maritime nation. Next slide, please. The interventions that we are undertaking is um, one of them being the Maritime Awareness Program, uh, which involves several activities that we undertake in terms of raising awareness about the oceans and the maritime sector. The first intervention that we've um, introduced is Career Expos, where Sahimi has participated and collaborated in Career Expos to support awareness, particularly to learners. We provide a platform for cadets to assist and participate in these Career Expos across the country, uh, where cadets are able to uh, interact with learners and provide them with first-hand information about careers at sea. The second intervention is Job Summits. We we have held or hosted a women's job summit under the theme Women Dive in Career Opportunities in the Maritime Sector, which was aimed at continuing the SAIMI efforts to ensure that women are equally included in attaining career opportunities across the maritime sector as a critical transformational component. Thirdly, Youth Dialogues. As June is Youth Month, Saimi recently holded a youth dialogue as a build-up to this day of the seafarer. Participants included high school learners from maritime schools, university students currently studying towards a seafarer career, cadets currently enrolled and experiencing life at sea, as well as youth involved in seagoing activities. We put the same questions to them under the theme Future for Seafarers, where the youth shared their opinion on the poll questions raised by the IMO. Fourthly, um, we've created or launched a diving career exploration website 
and in the process of developing a mobile app um, to introduce South Africa's youth to the multitude of choices related to careers in the um, ocean's economy. The mobile app is currently under development, which will allow learners to access career information from their phones. We've also developed a comprehensive career guide, which is available and will be distributed to all schools. There are also several other initiatives being rolled out with schools, both on a high school and primary school level. Next, please. There are also several other initiatives being rolled out with schools, both on a high school and primary school level. Next, please. Then our youth development programs, uh, part of building South Africa as a maritime nation is to show young people the career Then possibilities offered by the ocean's economy and to support development of practical skills at school level in order to create awareness and interest. SAIMI supports several development initiatives for youth and maritime school learners. The intention is to strengthen the National Seafarer Development Program by widening the pool of potential recruits and supporting better preparedness of learners for maritime studies. There are currently four youth development programs underway, namely the Royal Cape Yacht Club Sailing Academy, or RCYC, Sail Africa Youth Development Foundation, the General Buatha Old Boys Bursary Fund, or Jiboba, and the South African Sea Cadets. These youth development programs include sailing, uh, swimming, safety courses, holiday camps, exposure to many facets of the maritime industry, maritime skills, self-discipline, and leadership. Next, please. Now, the skills, education, and trading capacity and development support that we provide is encompasses several facets and Sahimi has collaborated with um, several organizations countrywide and has um, initiated several interventions to support and capacitate the um, education and training sector. So Sahimi provides support to educational institutions uh, from secondary school level through to colleges and universities in growing their capacity to deliver maritime education and training. We are also actively involved in developing the capacity of South African public education institutions to deliver maritime training and support the growth of the sector from the introduction of maritime subjects in high schools and supporting TVET colleges in becoming centers of maritime artisan training through to development of degree qualifications at university level and postgraduate research programs. In terms of our partnerships, various skills development initiatives have been implemented by SAIM in partnership with many stakeholders in the sector, which include government, CETAs, academic institutions, TVET colleges, maritime high schools and industries. A strengthening of partnerships with industry remains critical for SAIM in the implementation of skills development initiatives, as this will enable the Institute to better understand industry skills requirements to ensure that the skills produced meet the industry requirements. As this will enable capacitation of South African public education institutes to deliver maritime training and the support the growth the growth of the maritime sector, collaboration with the SA College School um, Principals Organization aims at increasing the particip participation of TVET colleges in the maritime sector, um, with a multi-stakeholder task being team being formulated to drive the process in terms of lecture development Sahimi is also engaged in lecture, lecture development with the three main maritime universities, namely Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Durban University of Technology, as well as the Nelson Mandela University. Teacher development qualifications. We are also looking at developing a teacher qualification to assist Um, teachers to actually teach the maritime um, subjects in high school. Um, the people that teach nautical science at maritime high school, for instance, hold seafarer qualifications and will have working experience at sea, but may not necessarily have a teaching qualification. Saimi has therefore identified the need to ensure that individuals who are already in the education system and those seafarers that may have an interest in teaching 
are able to obtain an accredited teaching qualification. In terms of maritime high schools, um, SAIMI, in, in partnership with the Transport Education and Training Authority, provides support to maritime high schools, which covers training of teachers, lecturers, providing technology, equipment, or teaching materials, and generally supporting development of new programs. We also have online textbooks available for free um, for maritime economics and nautical science. We also have uh, available to uh, both university students, high school learners, um, e-learning material, which consists of modules and videos, which will allow learners to have visual insight to work and life at sea. Next slide, please. Okay, now our focus today basically will just be on two categories of seafarers, which is the officers of the navigational watch, which is deck officer or cadet, and the officers of the engineering watch, um, engineer officer or cadet. We have several other categories of um, seafarers in our national seafarer development program, but today we will just uh, speak about these two. Now, the training component uh, for the officers of the watch um, consists of the academic component as well as the work integrated learning component. Next, please. The academic component um, is normally um, done at universities or colleges. Um, which uh, deliver maritime or marine engineering studies, uh, which includes the academic subjects, and those are the three universities that generally offer those um, degrees. Next, please. In terms of entry requirements uh, for these um, degrees, uh, firstly, uh, in, in fact, in terms of the work inter integrated learning component, we have entry requirements. You have to have completed your maritime or marine engineering studies at university. And then candidates are also required to pass the prescribed medical and eye tests um, in order to um, continue with the National Cadet Program and obtain certificates of competency. Next, please. In order to... Continue with the national cadet In terms of the practical component, it's made up of several phases, the initial uh, initiation phase being the pre c uh, short courses that is done. In terms of Next is your exper experiential phase, which is, phases, consists of onboard training at sea, as well as advanced ancillary courses. Thirdly, the completion phase, which includes oral preparation and exams, and then finally graduation. The training component of the National Cadet um, program is delivered by our recruitment and placement agencies and training providers who are um, the South African Maritime Academy or SAMTRA and Marie Crew Service at this point in time. They have been involved in the uh, program since the program's inception and we'd like to thank them for their commitment in the training of our seafarers. Next. Okay, women empowerment. Um, you heard previous speakers mention that the uh, percentage of women in maritime is quite low. In fact, global average of women in the sector is 2%. And um, earlier on, the speaker also mentioned that 900 out of the 10,000 South African seafarers are women, which represents if we look at our National Seafarer Development Program at this point in time, uh, with the active learners in the program, actually 31% is represented by women, which is obviously a huge increase in terms of where we were in the past, and hopefully that will be the continued trend going forward. So there has been specific emphasis over the last years to recruit uh, women into the program. We also had a um, event about a year ago uh, where a group of um, women seafarers were actually um, crewed the SA Gallus um, to an uh, expedition to Antarctica. The all-female crew, next slide please, um, made history when they settled on a voyage to Antarctica in December 2019 
It was the first time that an all-women crew was deliberately recruited to man the Islaya Gallus, the country's only dedicated uh, cadet training vessel. The crew of 22 women, consisting of two training officers and 20 young female cadets, returned from the voyage to Antarctica at the end of March 2020. This deliberate action of women crew was done in support of the advancement of gender equality in the maritime sector. The all-female uh, crew on board the Agalas were accompanied by scientists from the International Centre for Antarctic Ocean Research who conducted research during the trip. Next slide, please. For okay, skills development in the future. Um, traditional mo models of training, recruiting, retaining talent, as well as a way of doing business need to change to remain relevant to the needs of 4IR, or the fourth industrial revolution. Education and training policies need to adapt in terms of um, changing technological needs. Um, there have been various key drivers of change in the number of industries recently, including technological advance advancements which have emphasized the need for the identification of skills and training to adapt to the changing um, technology environment. The first industrial revolution has brought about what has been referred to as the digital disruption, which has required various industries to adapt. The maritime industry has seen, amongst other things, the development of smart ports and discussions on maritime autonomous service ships. These autonomous vessels will be operated with reduced manning or being unmanned with remote monitoring operation or be fully um, autonomous. So we definitely have to adapt and make sure that our um, seafarers are skilled to be able to handle the, the future uh, world of work. Next, please. In terms of employment um, creation, uh, for our cadets, um, cadets that graduate as officers have mu numerous career options open to them. However, the great majority tend to obtain employment with the participating shipping companies as navigating or engineer officers. As the employment market is a global one, they have the option of following careers in cargo ships, fashion liners, tankers, bulk carriers, or in the oil and gas sector, where they would serve on ships that support the oil rigs. Those that wish to follow careers on ashore can secure employment in the numerous serve, uh, support services to the industry. Training providers have um, established um, contacts with a number of companies in the industry that recruit seafarers, and these are utilized when required. Uh, the global employment market is in a difficult situation, and high levels of shortages of suitably qualified and trained seafarers are being experienced. Graduates of the program, we have to have a high placement rate in general. Then we're looking at strengthening the system to deliver qualified seafarers, what we are doing in that regard. Um, Saimi will be conducting a study on the existing seafarer program um, to design, articulate, and elaborate on a conceptual framework for the National Seafarer Development Program. The framework document is meant to effectively map out a national seafarer development terrain for Sahimi with a clear consideration of the international requirements, starting at the level of basic education all the way through to the absorption into the labor market. Furthermore, the framework would map the relevant stakeholders across the seafarer development pipeline, its strategic roles and value uh, propositions. Ultimately, this will enable the development of a much more strategic strategic approach to seafarer development for the country, a comprehensive and con consolidated strategy approach and national overarching program. Then lastly, the other initiatives that we are currently looking at is a South African graduated seafarers database. Um, in addition to the seafarer um, that come through the National Seafarer Development Program, there are South African seafarers who may have obtained their qualifications through other companies. We intend inviting them onto our database platform so that Sahimi can develop a comprehensive South African qualified seafarer database. We are also looking at tracking the employment of status of graduates. This will, amongst others, assist with providing data on employment rates. 
Lastly, creating a, a networking platform for seafarers uh, to engage with us and with each other and give the seafarers a voice. Um, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of our seafarers and pledge our support to your future. Um, on that note, I thank you and hand over to the program director. Um, on that note, I thank you and hand over to the program director. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Adman. Thank you, Mrs. Adman, for your presentation with regards to the skills development and support that is available in the maritime industry. And I think ensuring a fair future for seafarers also means developing transitional measures from sea to shore. And all these are skills that need to be met. And we thank you because the Saini is in the process of developing all these uh, policies to our uh, to assist the industry. In the process, I also want to once again make apologies for our technical glitches. The chat is disabled on our teams and we are unable to receive them. And we have recognized some people who have raised their hands who want to and we are unable to receive them. And we have recognized some people who have raised their hands. We have noted many other participants who want to share their comments and questions through raising of their hands. We, we, have no, we will have a session later on uh, when all the presenters have, uh, have finished with their presentations. And then we will deal with comments and questions from the floor. And we will also entertain those which are on social media, especially on Facebook, because we can see them as they are coming through. At this time, as I had uh, promised earlier, we also have recordings of seafarers themselves who want to share their own experiences. And at this stage, we will not speak for them, but they will speak for themselves. So now we will play the videos for the seafarers. They will speak for themselves. So now we'll play the videos for the seafarers. They will speak for themselves. So now we'll play the videos for the seafarers. Good day, my name is Bono Zamini and I am a deck cadet. Um, the question that was raised to my attention was, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, what do I feel is most important to me as a seafarer? First and foremost, I believe it is the priority of COVID-19 the COVID-19 vaccine for seafarers. As it is mentioned, more than 80% of the global trade moves via the maritime industry. And that means more than 2 million seafarers are responsible to operate the global fleet. With the rise of the pandemic, there has been more travel restrictions, less crew changes, as well as less repatriations. And that has really affected um, seafarers, more than hundreds of thousands that have got to be. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As we are still waiting for the video to, to play through, I want to welcome all those that joined us later on and just express our gratitude for becoming part of our program today. As I said earlier, bear with us. We are having some technical glitches, but our technicians are on it, and uh, soon we will be we'll be on on the way and and playing the videos. But our technicians are on it. Good day. My name is Bano Zamini, and I am a deck cadet. Um, the question that was raised to my attention was, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
what the UN feel is most important to me as a CPO. First and foremost, I believe it is the prioritization of the COVID-19 vaccine for CPOs. As it is mentioned, more than 80% of the global trade moves via the maritime industry. And that means more than 80% to operate the global fleet. With the rise of the pandemic, there has been more travel restrictions, less crew changes, as well as less repatriations. And that has really affected um, CPOs, more than hundreds of thousands that have got to be stuck on board, affecting their emotional being. As we know that the safer the CPOs means the safer the seas. So with the prioritization of the vaccine for CPOs, certainly means less travel restrictions, more crew changes, as well as more repatriations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lebo Hang, Prince Mokotevi. It's Hello, my name is Lebo Hang, Prince Mokotevi. Hello, my name is Lebo Hang, Prince Mokotevi. Is it playing now? It's stop, stop, stop. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It appears we are still experiencing glitches um, from our side. Um, I profusely apologize for. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It appears we are still experiencing glitches um, from our side. Uh, okay. I um, profusely apologize for. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we are still experiencing too far away. Okay. Go back. Yeah. Right. This is yes, you can talk now. Good afternoon, ladies and what? gentlemen. Sorry, sorry, can you hear? Okay. I didn't see that. Uh, Go back. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can they hear you now? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can actually hear me now. Good afternoon, um, again. Good afternoon. A thousand times apology for the techni technical glitches that we've been facing. Um, I'm not sure if um, you can actually hear me. Can I just um, get somebody to just confirm that you can hear me from where you are? Um, I'm not sure if. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you. Hear you. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Um, good afternoon. Good morning. And um, it is again back on the Tavisang Dema from Samsa. Um, we are about to continue with the program. We do apologize for the glitches that we've actually been facing. I think we will take a, a decision to cut down or to cut off the, 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 the videos because uh, it doesn't look like we are winning from this side. For whatever reason, we seem to be really facing serious problems with, uh, with the videos. The sound is not coming out clear. And unfortunately, as much as we would have wanted to, to showcase and to actually have these videos on, we're going to have to actually park them and hopefully at some point somewhere we will get to use them uh, without any waste of time um, I, I have to actually call upon mr musam bagaza from um, i from amso mr bagaza um, are you ready are you there can you hear me Good morning, and thank you very much. Um, we definitely we have you now on the platform. Somebody's actually going to be streaming your presentation. Can you just um, just um, be um, just hang tight for us? Thank you. Thank you.
we definitely no, need to have you now on the platform. Thank Somebody you, is actually going to be streaming your presentation. Can you just add, just um, uh, program please, director, uh, may I make a humble you, request? You may, sir. Uh, no attempt to uh, disrupt proceedings, but uh, may I humbly program request that we uh, observe a moment of silence. You may, sir. We have lost two of our seafarers this week due to COVID-19, and I'm sure it would be a gesture that would resonate within the industry in honor of those fallen heroes. It is noted, sir. Can we request to take a moment of silence as in starting from now? Thank you. It is noted, sir. Can we request to take a moment of silence as in starting from now? Thank you. It is noted, sir. Can we request to take a moment of silence as in starting from now? Thank you. It is noted, sir. Can we request to take a moment of silence as in starting from now? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mbagaza. I think um, we can actually continue with the program. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Mbagaza. Uh, thank you, I think, uh, uh, appreciate the we can honor. actually continue with the program. And thank the presentation is supposed to be coming through onto the patience. screen. Thank you, Mr. Mbagaza. Uh, uh, just bear with us. And the presentation is supposed to be coming through onto the screen. No, it's not yet here. Thank you, Mr. Magaza. Uh, just bear with us. Can anybody see the presentation from their side? No, it's not yet here. Not yet. Just bear with us. Are you winning there? Okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Over to you. No, it's not yet here. Not yet. Um, thank you, Program Director. Um, I, okay. I represent okay, AMSO. Uh, for those you. who don't know, uh, it's an African Marine Solutions, and I'll be talking um, from an employer of CFA's perspective I, I, in terms of the I challenges we've had, AMSO. how we've dealt with COVID, and how prepared are we for the third wave. Just for a brief overview of our organization, for those that don't know, our vision is to provide safe and sustainable marine solutions to clients and facilitate growth and transformation of the regional ocean economy. Our, we, are made, we are a South African 100% owned company, 57% black owned, with 60% uh, women ownership. 33% uh, is uh, made up of our employee trust, which is uh, employee owned, meaning that all our permanent employees are actually shareholders within the organization. A quick overview of our employees, we, 80, we have 86% uh, black South Africans of uh, a total of 560 employees, 40% youth and 15% women. Uh, we've invested over 25 million uh, in the last year, in the last three years in skills development. Uh, we've spent 460 million to local suppliers, uh, including SMEs. This is in line with uh, our vision in transforming uh, the regional ocean economy, economy in, within South Africa, and also supported a majority of black-owned businesses with an 18 million spend only in 2020. Next slide, please. Within South Africa, and also supported a majority of black-owned businesses with an 18 million spend only in 2020. Can we move on to the next slide? Um, a brief overview of uh, operation. Uh, we manage 19 vessels um, of various design uh, and operations, uh, 12 of which are South um, African flagged of, uh, and uh, working within um, Africa, uh, Namibia, and Mozambique. Of the fleet of 19, I'll just mention a few uh, new projects which should be of interest to the delegates. We've got the Clenston, uh, which is a recent charter operating off the coast of Ghana. We've got the Isikalo coastal tanker operating um, within Durban. 
and we've had two vessels in Afungi Bay, uh, which operated there in support of the total operations. And then we've got the flagship vessels, which uh, I'm sure a lot of the delegates are aware of, including the Agales Amanda, to name but a few. And next slide, please. So in dealing with the global pandemic, um, I'll just uh, draw some stats. Uh, the stats are based on 2020 and do not include the recent uh, to uh, so in dealing with the global uh, dates that we have mentioned earlier, um, we've conducted over 842 tests uh, of our seafarers, mainly not all 842 people, but we've had to do numerous tests in uh, some instances. Um, we've had 50 positive cases. Uh, a lot of those were pre-joining um, that we caught uh, through our rigorous screening uh, protocols. So in, in dealing with the COVID, we've had to uh, bring in place uh, or implement um, awareness programs with our partners like EHS, which looked at the anxiety, the psychological effect of seafarers dealing through the uh, pandemic. Um, this has come at a huge cost outlay of around 3 million in terms of those programs and in supporting individual families that were hard hit. Pandemic. We've had to change uh, the way we do business uh, by with the new norm uh, in, in maintaining sustainable operations by uh, equipping the vessels with virtual um, means to do hold meetings to maintain our footprint, uh, including equipping uh, office staff to work from home and ensuring that we provide the support to our seafarers at all times as the operations never stopped and we needed to adapt to the changing circumstances. We've had uh, to adapt uh, by ensuring that we have uh, an outbreak management plan that included the consequential management uh, in terms of ensuring that should we have a positive incident on board, and we are well equipped and well prepared to deal with such. We've made donations to the Solidarity Fund and uh, cooperated with uh, numerous NGOs in our areas of operations. Uh, we've also ensured that we supply and continually supply PPE to our vessels to ensure that they are fully equipped and minimize any risk to the pandemic. We've also had to uh, have proofful partnerships with our clients in terms of projects and uh, adapting how we do business, uh, in, in ensuring that we uh, ensure the health and safety of our crew members, but also ensuring that the projects are done in a timely way. Next slide. Ensure the health and safety of our crew members. Moving on to the third wave um, and how we are prepared. Um, it's been an unprecedented time for all industries, especially for our seafarers. Um, we've had to have well-established protocols in virus prevention. Time. This has ensured us that we minimize any fatalities within 2020 and ensure business sustainability throughout that uh, process. We've had to implement rigorous testing protocols for seafarers and passengers uh, to minimize the risk of uh, breaking the bubble, as we call it, on board the vessels. Um, we've had pre-quarantine uh, procedures uh, implementation, especially on passenger carrying vessels. As you can imagine, with the increase in people, the, there is an increase in risk um, for those vessels. So the measures in place there are far more stringent and rigorous to ensure that we maintain a COVID-free vessel. Uh, we've had numerous challenges um, at times out of our hands with regards to cross-border crew changes, uh, but the mental fortitude uh, demonstrated by our seafarers is one to commend as uh, they understood and, kept, uh, and carried the baton in ensuring that operations are done. We've also had to implement at times um, isolation on board the vessels um, in line with maintaining the health of our members. Um, this meant that we had to suspend shore leave, which in itself brought some psychological uh, challenges to the seafarers. Uh, but due to the safety protocols, uh, we've, they, they understood that there was uh, a greater play in, in this instance. We've also limited contractor access on board in, in terms of maintaining our vessels. It is something that we would entirely want to not do. Um, in terms of getting contractors on board, but it is a necessity to maintain the vessels uh, 
to flare class uh, standard. But what we've done is we've ensured that the protocols in place are such that they minimize the risk imposed on the vessel's crew and that they are controlled and managed in a proper process. We've had to uh, ensure uh, the well-being impacted. It has been an impact with people staying on board with limited opportunities for exercise. Um, we've had measures where we've um, bought uh, gym equipment as an initiative to maintain the physical um, health of the workers on, on, on our bay vessels. We've even, even relaxed some of the shore leave constraints by allowing them to go on the key, uh, adhering to COVID protocols to ensure that they still have that uh, mental uh, ability to work and the physical health to, to exercise and still maintain a good morale on board. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, in closure, I would like to um, again uh, really reiterate the unprecedented year that our seafarers have faced and the challenges that they've uh, all uh, gone through. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact and we will strive with all means to ensure that we support them throughout this process. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, Mr. Mbagaza, and thank you very much also to AMSO for actually allowing you to come and present to um, to, to, to the session. Um, I think, um, you know, from your presentation, it actually does show the commitment from AMSO, and um, we are actually looking to continue with the partnerships that we have ourselves and equally with, you know, the rest of uh, the maritime industry. Um, to moving on to onto our project, uh, onto our, um, our session, I do believe that there's an echo. I'm not sure if um, you know the echo is still there as I'm speaking, but um, I'm hoping that it's actually not distracting you from hearing um, from hearing us from this side. Uh, without any waste of time, um, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Captain Mike Melly who is actually going to be speaking from his notes. Um, he did not actually, uh, he does, he's not going to be to, um, presenting a presentation, but he will speak from his notes. Um, Captain Melly, uh, welcome. And uh, let me just make sure that I get your name right this time around. It is Captain Mike Melly, not anything else. Um, welcome and thank you very much for joining us and we thank you for your time. Uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Honourable Minister, esteemed guests, life at sea in the early days was very different to what it is now. However, as much as things change, they stay the same. Consider this, in 1895, a young upstart, 20 years old, by the name of Marconi, invented radio. And, in, and as one captain complained to another, whilst the transocean, transoceanic cable, I beg your pardon, shortened the line of communication, this strengthened owner's control and gradually reduced the role of the captain, thus reducing him in his, his view to the role of an underpaid first-class clerk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, how strange that this is exactly what friends warned me about 120 years later when I personally expressed an interest in returning to the sea after a long career ashore. Now, one of the things that attracted me to the sea was what arguably makes the seafaring life distinctive the persistence of maritime law. Now, at the center of this has always been the master who, in a contemporary's view, was answerable for everything and subject to emergencies which perhaps no other man executing authority among civilized people is subject to. That was obviously in the days before pilots, aircraft pilots. Now, exploring this further, a gentleman by the name of Hopkins wrote in 1873 that mariners were exposed to a class of casualties and perils from which the landsman is exempt. He then listed a concerning range of possible problems. There are troubles in port as well as at sea, he said. Monetary embarrassment, legal structures, opposed interests, conflicting authorities. Seafaring is one of the oldest professions around and it dates back to the early days of, of trade. Of course, it's changed, and we've roughly 56,000 ships in the world today, manned by about 1.65 million seafarers. Roughly 9% of those ships are passenger ships, and the balance are cargo ships of one type or another. 
Passenger ships are responsible for employing about 25% of all seafarers, most of these being hotel staff. Our friend Mr. Hopkins would be horrified to learn that instead of the troubles he spoke of being resolved, they are today much worse than he would ever have imagined. Now, it's all too easy to blame the pan pandemic, as many do, but the fact is that COVID has merely unmasked a plethora of underlying problems which lie beneath the surface. Most, con most seafarers today are contractual workers. This is a problem in itself. I've actually heard them being referred to as mercenaries, but it's shipping companies who forced seafarers to move from being permanent employees into freelancers. In a way, these contractual workers, contracts either get extended beyond their wishes or they sit at home unable to travel, waiting for a new contract. For example, to give you a personal example, I signed a six-month contract to serve as master of a bulk carrier in August last year. My ship traded mostly around the Middle and the Far East. I was, a, a, sorry, I was able to leave my vessel finally only at the a, end of April this year. That's nearly nine months. Nine months at sea, locked in a steel prison. Yet I was one of the lucky ones. Others have served up to 14 months, as you've heard. I'm fortunate to work for employers who work hard even to the point of deviating their ships sometimes to affect crew changes. My employers also fortunately resist the immoral attempts of charters to write a no crew change clause into charter parties. That is disgusting. Now, in our case, it was the failure of governments to comply with the legislation which they themselves had introduced. Now, I speak here of the MLC, which allows crew changes to happen. I finally managed to disembark, although not without much difficulty, in India, and then I promptly contracted COVID whilst traveling. Please note that I exclude South Africa from the countries on my personal blacklist, thanks particularly to SAMHSA and our DOT. We're a regime which is friendly to crew changes, yet affects these sensibly and with due regard to the proper health protocols. Thank you and well done, SAMHSA and the DOT, not for not agreeing to crew changes and then making them so difficult to achieve by imposing complicated requirements for them as others have done. And I think you're of one country which brags about allowing crew changes, but only allows them to do so to embark or disembark during certain hours. It's You have to have, for example, um, a PCR test um, done once you get ashore, uh, before you're allowed to proceed to the, the, the hotel, which sits in a bubble, which is quite correct. Um, however, that little kiosk, which does the, the, the PCR test, is only open during certain hours. Now, ships only call in that port during certain hours for a short period to, to load bunkers, for example, or perhaps take stores. Now, as Mr. Madia said so correctly earlier, it is time to get to work on making the vaccine available to all sea, visiting seafarers, whether South African or foreign, now that the J&J single-dose vaccine is available once again, please, I appeal to you on behalf of all seafarers, we need this jab to keep us safe whilst traveling, as well as to keep us safe from shore officials whilst abroad. Now, I personally didn't travel to a large number of countries during my, my eight-month, nine-month stint, but I can assure you that South Africa was the friendliest of them all. We were treated as lepers in most others, to the point of not even being allowed out on deck in port in one. Now, I must ask why, when we are hardly super spreaders. So long as we abide by sensible and strict protocols, which we do, we live in secure bubbles, which are only breached by shore officials. It is simply not possible for us to be infected whilst at sea. Accessibility to the vaccine will reduce the risk that we face from shore officials. Now, I cannot talk about the subject without mentioning the unmentionable. And this one burns me badly. It's the case of that master who died at sea recently after his ship called at one of our own ports. Now, he recently joined the ship, so perhaps he was infected whilst traveling to the ship. Perhaps he was infected by somebody, um, one of the, the port officials, which I doubt. One of the cases we will never know where he was. What was astonishing and disgusting was the attitude of the countries that the ship sailed past or to, which firstly refused him treatment, 
and then once he died, refused his permit, sorry, refused to permit his body to be taken ashore and to be repatriated. I'm sorry to have to mention this, but there was even talk of his body having to be incinerated at sea. Are you aware that his crew would most likely have had to dismember his body to fit it into the incinerator? That sounds disgusting, I know, but it's true. I would suggest that it would only be fair for seafarers and their employers to start boycotting countries who treat their fellow seafarers, their fellow humans so badly. Forget about the lack of shore leave. I know of no ports which permit shore leave and the chance to get to the shops to buy that one item that you really want, but that's not going to happen for a while. Put aside for a moment the fact that all seafarers are unable to travel home when someone close to them is, is ill or even dies. That happened to me last year. I was informed that my sister had passed away whilst I was busy navigating my vessel through the Singapore Straits one of the busiest times. One just has to endure these things. It's what we do. Think for a moment instead of the fact that for every seafarer unable to sign off and proceed on leave, another is unable to get back to work. Think also of the risks that they face when they do travel, remembering that only one or two countries have made va vaccines available to seafarers, and we're not one of them yet. These countries are the states and I believe um, Netherlands. Others have made vaccine available to port workers, but not seafarers. Other than COVID, there are many other troubles to use Mr. Hopkins' words, which we face. Remember that every officer aboard a ship has to have a certificate of competency, his license. Every COC, if, sorry, every seafarer, officers and ratings by law have to have attended basic courses as attended by the STCW. Yet, we deal every day with ship's agents, customs officers, immigration officials, even ship owners who are not required to have any qualification whatsoever and who have very little, if any, understanding of the life of a seafarer. In the case of port authorities, such as customs, port health, and so on, we subjected to extortion attempts in many ports every time we berth. I'm not including South Africa, thankfully. I steal myself every time we arrive in port to stand up to these officials who demand to be allowed into the crew accommodation, for example, on some ruse or another. Of course, I know that they're legally entitled to, but I have to find one, just one yet, who was able to show me a valid COVID certificate showing me that his test results were negative. They don't have these test results. And all they're after is to try and bribe us. Putting COVID aside for a moment again, I ask that you think for a moment about minimum safe manning. This is the minimum level of manning which the administration considers safe for the running of a ship. But just how safe is it when the same administrations have to police our work rest hours, which admittedly many flog. I'm of course not one of them, when they know that they're gonna get into trouble when their hours have gone red yet again. Just how much thought has gone into this? Let's consider port state inspections and vetting inspections, the purpose of which is said to be to, be to check compliance with SOLAS and other statutory instrument, instruments and to main sta maintain standards. Now, of course, I support that in principle. No question about it. However, these inspections have become audits or fault-finding missions of the worst type at times. Of course, somebody's going to get into trouble when an adverse finding is made. I agree that one has to draw the line somewhere, but just how much thought has gone into deciding where to draw that, draw that line? There are practical folk out there, but there are also many others who are usually less trained, I admit, who adopt officious, even arrogant police type attitudes when encountering even the most minor of administrative misdemeanors. Now, all this does is to promote the blame game which all p &I clubs and others with genuine vested interest in safety at sea will tell you is hardly conducive to a safety culture. So, my friends, this is self-defeating and it's wholly unfair in practice. Surely there are better ways of ensuring compliance. The quality of life aboard ships is nowhere near what it is ashore. 
regardless of what any employer invests in this area. Connectivity has improved, but Wi-Fi remains expensive and very slow. The availability of news from ashore is tightly controlled, perhaps due to the cost of delivering it to a ship. Seafarers are normal people, at least most of us are, and we enjoy hearing what's happening ashore. There are limits to this, of course, and I personally hope never to ever have to live through a US presidential election at sea again. My Filipino crew have been starved of lo local information, which for them has been a challenge, albeit a relatively minor one. Finally, I need to raise concerns which I have with the training of our youngsters. In the first instance, I have concerns about an education system which it seems to me often complies more with the needs of our education authorities than with our actual training needs. And that's why it was interesting to hear Saimi talking about this just now. And this is a subject all of its own, which we need to get to delve deeper into. Sam's introduced the National Cadet Program some years ago, which has met, let's face it, with only partial success, mainly because of the paucity of births which are made available by foreign shipping companies, and we don't have many South African ones. Yet we continue to motivate and inspire youngsters to go to sea. We churn them out in numbers and we create expectations of employment, which we simply cannot meet. I know of many graduates who've qualified in our institutions with their diplomas or their degrees, but they have yet to find a berth a couple of years later. Is it really fair to promote a career at sea when we're not going to be able to meet their expectations? I can only hope that more is going to be done to encourage foreign companies who trade with us, with South Africa in particular, to employ South African cadets. It's also time to engage constructively with programs such as the SATS General Botha, All Boys Association Bursary Fund, which was also mentioned earlier. Remembering that it was the alumni of this famous training school that built the excellent reputation that South African seafarers have enjoyed internationally for a hundred years or more. Today, many have returned to give back by sponsoring promising youngsters through Law Hill Maritime College and their tertiary training, but mostly and especially through the way the old salts, some of these legends in the international maritime industry, mentor and encourage the youngsters. I can tell you that in my personal experience, Practically speaking, these cadets are amongst the best prepared I've had the pleasure of employing at all of sailing with. They have been trained by the best. I urge you also to throw your weight behind programs such as the Port Welfare Committees, which can make a big difference in the everyday, everyday life of seafarers when in port. My colleague and good friend, the Reverend Mark Clarsen, will no doubt tell you more about this. In closing, I thank you for this opportunity to present the case of the seafarer. And I appeal to you to do something about a situation which is very, very wrong. We've heard many words about what will be done, but many of these words have been empty. An example is that South Africa declared seafarers to be key workers last year. But how has that translated into practice? Yes, food changes has been a part, part of that, but I put it to you that until vaccines are made available, this is going to continue to sound hollow. It is your actions which will affect the lives, not only of those 1.6 million seafarers currently at sea, but also of the lives of their families. And I would estimate that to be around about 8 million, 9 million lives around the world in total, if not more. Thank you for listening and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Captain Mali. Um, you have indeed left us with a food for thought. I think um, as we continue with the discussions on this platform, uh, we have a whole lot of um, issues that we need to actually ponder on. We have a whole lot of issues that um, we need to really be looking at and addressing. Um, this platform was definitely made to make sure that we are not here to be singing our praises but we are here to actually highlight and actually talk to issues that are real issues. I guess the question at the end of the day is, what are we doing about all these issues that have actually come out from these sessions? And with that, uh, let me allow in um, one of the panel members, 
Uh, she is equally a seafarer, and um, she is actually waiting to come in. Her name is Slindi Le. Slindi, we thank you and we appreciate you making the time to actually come through and actually being part of the panel. Um, over to you and welcome again. Uh, good morning, Honourable Minister, guests and seafarers. My name is Slindu Gutenyoga. I am a Chief Officer with TNPA Dredging Services. I've been uh, at sea for 14 years in the maritime industry, and 10 of those years have been on foreign-going sailing vessels. Okay, so prior to COVID, I would say life of a seafarer was, was pretty straightforward. You would join a ship, serve your time as per your contract, and at the end of your contract, you would be repatriated to your home port, your hometown. No problems, no hassles. There were obviously delays here and there, but nothing major. Fast forward to 2020, COVID pandemic struck globally, causing governments around the world to suspend international flights, close borders, close airports, and ports. They imposed travel restrictions to foreign nationals to limit the spread of the COVID, the COVID virus. These restrictions impacted seafarers. Seafarers could not travel between their residence to their place of work. In this case, it was the ships. Those that were on leave could not be deployed for their next assignment, meaning you had seafarers that were stuck at home, leave expired, they can't join, and so they suffered financial loss. Those that were on board, they were basically stuck there with no crew changes and with no knowledge as to when they would be required to join. Basically, seafarers, basically, crew change had become an extreme sport, and seafarers have been collateral victims to this crisis. According to IMO, as of March 2021, it is estimated that plus minus 200,000 seafarers remain on board commercial vessels with uncertainty as to when they will be relieved and they are past the expiry of the contracts that they hold. Such conditions have resulted in the mental and physical well-being of the crew. If this has been compromised, Maritime Labor Convention, MLC, states that the maximum continuous period that a seafarer could serve on board on a vessel without leave is 11 months. This may be exceeded in situations of force majeure. Currently, we have seafarers that have been that have exceeded this 11 months. Some have been on board for 14 months, 13 months, and the list goes on. Crew members that are fortunate enough to be able to be deployed have to be quarantined before joining vessels. This quarantine period comes again with the financial loss. It comes with the financial loss because crew members that are quarantined for that period cannot benefit from a full salary. Companies are unable to pay them for full salaries during quarantine. Some get 25%, some get 50% of their basic salary. Our government needs to do better for seafarers. Yes, you have seafarers as frontline workers, but why are they not getting the vaccine? As Captain Millie also stated, that yes, the work is there. You say that we are frontline workers. The title has been given, but what has been done about it? It defeats the point to call us frontline workers where we are here with no vaccine, where there are still travel restrictions because we do not have vaccine. Shipping carries more than 80% of global trade by volume. Those ships need seafarers to navigate and run them. How will this happen if they are stuck at home due to travel restrictions and crew change? and the red tape that has been put there. Giving seafarers the vaccine will allow them to freely move around crew changes and, and crew changes will be able to take place without hindrance due to the pandemic. Another major problem that we are sitting with as a country is documentation. COVID and its restrictions resulted in training institutions and SAMHSA closing temporarily. When these restrictions were lifted and seafarers were able to go to training for their courses, they were met by a major hurdle. SAMHSA had a massive backlog. Certificates could not be revalidated in time. Now seafarers are stuck waiting for these documents because they cannot work with the expired documents. Seafarers have had to renew in terms just so that they can 
go to sea to prevent because due to this backlog. All in all, the government needs to better support its seafarers. It's all very well for us to sit and discuss the problems forced. Sorry, it's all very well for us to sit and discuss the problems that we are faced, but it defeats the point if nothing will be done about it. We are hoping these discussions will not end here, that they will be taken further until a solution is found. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Hello. Thank you very much, um, Slee, uh, for that insight and obviously for sharing your thoughts and speaking on behalf of um, the young seafarers that are out there, the young and um, the matured ones, let me just say. Um, we are hearing you and um, we are actually wanting to make sure that, you know, we would deliver on the promises or on the SAMSA mandate or on the government's mandate to make sure that the seafarers, wherever they are, they know that they are being valued. Um, we will adhere, we'll endeavor to, to make sure that uh, we, 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 we move at a much faster pace or at a, must, uh, at a pace that, you know, everybody that is out there that is actually representing this country know that we are thinking of them and we appreciate the work that they do for South Africa. Um, with those words, let me welcome uh, my colleague, Mr. Ranzwabe. Um, Mr. Ranzwabe, are you ready? Please, can I allow you to step into the platform and uh, speak to your notes? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, my name is Lucy Soranzwabe. I'm a manager for OHS and Maritime Welfare here at the South African Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our Minister of Transport, Honorable Fugilem Balula, uh, our principal from the Department of Transport, uh, Maritime Branch, led by Acting DDG, Mr. Ntunzi Madia, uh, some support led by Ms. Ntato Minyuku, uh, our Acting CEO, Mrs. Tepiso Dawani Mashilane, and her executive, uh, fellow panel members, uh, men of the cloth, uh, we have men of the cloth in the audience who are providing an honorable service to our seafarers in the ports, we recognize you, the audience here today, last but not least, our special guest, the Seferas. Uh, Chair, allow me to close my camera so that we'll allow for better transmission. You are welcome, you can do that. Okay. I would like to take you back to 2020 when COVID-19 struck, we found ourselves locked in various places of habitation as a result of the strict lockdown regime that we found ourselves under. Yesterday, my colleague Mashudu from the Department of Transport, in emphasizing the importance of our seafarers, posted these words on Facebook. Our invisible, uh, underline, frontline personnel, essential workers weathering the storms of seven seas, gulfs, bays, and all water channels to facilitate global trade. End quote. Ships continue to carry global traded goods during all levels of lockdown. Uh, when I say ships, remember they are not autonomous yet, but they have people that navigate them that we call seafarers, keeping them on course and also brave men and women, braving the often harsh conditions in the engine rooms, ensuring smooth sailing. Harbors and ports remain open as well to ensure that we receive key and essential goods such as food, medicine, medical equipment, mobile phones, etc. It is unfortunate that despite the hard work and bravery displayed by our seafarers, the world failed to recognize them as key or essential workers. This has been echoed by our seafarers Earlier. So the seafarers globally were saying, we, meaning you people out there, you seem to like and appreciate key and essential items that we bring for you, we bring to you, I mean, we've been call shipping essential service, yet we, we were slow in declaring, in declaring them as essential or key workers. This was puzzling to seafarers. This was a question from seafarers around the world. During various lockdown regimes around the world, seafarers continued to struggle to disembark vessels and head home at the end of their contracts, six months contracts, 10 to 12 months and above. IMO and ILO intervened, and South Africa were one of the first group of countries that signed the declaration that sought to declare seafarers as key workers. Going back to my topic for today, or what did SAMSA do to assist the seafarers during that period? Um, in March 2020, as various lockdown regimes were being implemented around the world, as the countdown began, seafarers found themselves in a race against time. They were locked in various 
jurisdictions, which were not allowing any crew changes or disembarkations. Some seafarers found themselves stuck in locked airports around the world as they failed to beat the lockdown countdown. Many others remain on board, not knowing when next they will see their loved ones. We were all entering uncharted waters. Some have started receiving SOS messages from all corners of the world. We also followed social media to scan for posts from stranded seafarers. South Africa also banned international commercial flights at the time, which was absolutely necessary. I usually say seafarers operate virtually under the radar, not by fault of their own. The very nature of recruitment and the work is international. Unlike when you look at the South African expert base in, in various countries around the world, it's quite easy to, to get the numbers uh, as they will report to the SA foreign mission in the particular country and alert them of their presence in the country. With seafarers, it is difficult to get such data as they are always in transit and never in one country. This also made it difficult to understand the magnitude of the problem we were facing and also the amount of resources required to intervene. We started receiving individual requests for assistance with repatriation. I recall one of the first cases where a seafarer working on a private yacht was stuck in Mexico, not sure of his next move. We advised him to fly to Washington and also directed him to a mission in Washington, D.C., who were organizing a repatriation flight at the time. He made it home. I just want to make this clear uh, to avoid any confusion. Uh, in our current legal regime, repatriation is a competency of the net joint. SAMSA's role was from a welfare angle and to point the seafarers in the, in the right direction. We were not organizing repatriation flights. Our efforts were never going to be enough due to the magnitude of the problem. However, with the support from the Department of Transport and the colleagues at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, we managed to ensure that hundreds of seafarers were pointed to the right direction and made it home safely. So what did SAMSA exactly do? We started compiling a list of available, available repatriation flights departing from various cities across the world. Through our corporate affairs executive, Mr. Vusi September, who was on a 24-hour call, we started reaching out to SA foreign missions around the world, alerting them of the presence of seafarers in their territory and ensure that seafarers were also prioritized for repatriations. Earlier when repatriation started, there was this perception that said the uh, seafarers were better off since some were actually locked in floating hotels. This was not a government position. Between SAMSA and DOT, we began engaging our counterparts about the precarious position that the seafarers were working under. SA foreign missions abroad started including seafarers in repatriation flights in numbers. We also made contacts with known employers of South African seafarers and provided guidance on how they can bring South Africans home. The help was generally well received. We gave them guidelines that were set out by net joints on how to get yourselves back home, registering with the local SA foreign mission, gave them information of available or pending repatriation flights and routes that were South Africa friendly. This was a game changer, as instead of dealing with individual cases, we started dealing with groups. Crewing companies, ship owners, etc., started knocking at our door, asking for assistance in bringing South Africans home. Our own companies and those uh, uh, South African registered companies and those with a big presence in South Africa or operating from South, South Africa were exemplary in this, as they left no stones and ten in order to ensure that our seafarers are able to head home. We also connected employers of seafarers and encouraged them to pull resources, uh, for example, on chartered flights. At some point, we were dealing with airline charters who were seeking landing rights in South Africa. Of course, SAMSA is not a competent authority. However, being in the same stable as our vision counterparts, we were able to direct them in accordingly. The important thing during the process was to ensure that our seafarers get back home, and we also facilitated that they retain their jobs. Remember, we have no jurisdiction over those vessels when in those foreign countries not flying our, our flag. However, through diplomacy, we managed to forge relationships with a number of companies. We also found friends of seafarers raising the alarm in many social media platforms. One of these groups I would like to mention was a group called SA Seafarers. It was started by a parent of a seafarer. It continues today as a WhatsApp group and also as a Facebook, uh, has a Facebook page. They lobbied strongly for the protection of South African seafarers. We formed a collaboration with them as we had similar objectives and we shared as much information as possible within the perimeters of what government can and cannot share and had a mutually beneficial relationship. Our relationship afforded us access to seafarers that we would not have known about. In turn, together, we made sure hundreds of seafarers headed home. 
Uh, I hope Mrs. Talana Davis Mecklejohn is tuned in as she has done a sterling job. So whilst we're busy with humanitarian crises unfolding abroad, another one was unfolding right on our doorsteps. In the beginning of our lockdown, crew changes were not allowed, as Mr. Mr. Madia touched on this. Uh, and later we got to a stage where only South Africans were allowed for crew changes. SAMSA was receiving many distress calls from seafarers stuck on ships in our waters. We also had to deal with a lot of labor issues, some related to repatriation and some being contractual issues where companies were not paying salaries on time, blaming it all on COVID-19. I cannot overemphasize the importance of a good working relationship between SAMSA, DOT and the industry. It was also through this collaboration that we managed to assist many distressed nine South African seafarers. We also found an opportunity to ensure that international crew were able to disembark at our ports and head home via repatriation flights. They were replaced by South Africans as non-South African seafarers were not allowed in South Africa at that stage. This arrangement indirectly created much needed employment for our seafarers and at the same time highlighted the skill shortages in the actor, in this sector. So this was highlighted also by uh, Mr. Matia earlier. I, I think we were one of the first countries to ease crew change restrictions, even though, even though we were using unorthodox methods. However, many international seafarers were repatriated via South Africa. It was not the best route. However, this arrangement saw hundreds of non-South Africans being repatriated via South Africa through a process that was led by a friend of the seafarers, Ms. Mashudune Pumbara at DOT. Uh, we offered advice to the companies on repatriation flights, the foreign uh, employers of foreign crew, and, and also the health requirement to assist them in repatriation, their, in repatriating their crew out of South African ports. I think in South Africa, we never publicized this. Uh, as most people in the maritime world are not aware of this initiative. Uh, we were receiving a number of requests and directing them to DOT. We in turn process the documents with the relevant department in a smooth process. The distress calls kept coming mainly through our port offices with cries for help from fatigue seafarers on vessels transiting our waters. When we thought everything has settled, the sea started calling. We started receiving inquiries from seafarers who have been offered contracts abroad, but we were unable to leave South Africa as there were no commercial international flights. We started looking at outbound repatriation flights that were in South Africa to call it mostly European nationals. Uh, employers of South Africans also started contacting us looking for ways of getting the seafarers out there, out of South Africa. SAMSA and DOT continue to lobby on behalf of the seafarers. In the end, seafarers were allowed on these outbound repatriation flights so they could take up employment overseas. We continued offering advice on how to get out of South Africa when there were no international commercial flights. So the wheel had changed. Now we were taking, we were helping people get out of South Africa. SAMSA has always had an interest in seafarer welfare. However, the work was not centralized. The work is now centralized under the OHS and Maritime Welfare Unit. We are still building capacity. Uh, we were hampered also by COVID as we had to redirect our plans and focus on, on helping people come home. Uh, we are lucky that uh, at all levels of management uh, are occupied by people who are passionate about seafarer welfare, uh, starting at the top uh, from our acting ACEO, even the current acting ACEO is very passionate about the, the welfare of the seafarers. The, the SAMSA offers the following services to, to seafarers. We are, we are currently working on a, on a, on a seafarer welfare program, uh, which we are still, we are still consulting. Uh, we continue to work with other role players. Uh, on, on, we divided into South African seafarers and international seafarers. On in, with international seafarers, just a summary, we continue to work with other role players with interest in seafarer welfare, such as the mission of seafarers, we have spent many hours on vessels with, for an example, in Deben, there is Reverend Tammy Tembe, uh, attending to issues affecting seafarer welfare. We also work with other men of the cloth in various ports like McClassin in Richards Bay. We participate in welfare committees together with other role players such as ship owners, operate, operators, representatives, mission of seafarers and TNPA, etc. We also intervene on labor issues within the ports for, for non-South African nationals. On South African seafarers, we, we, we have put together a seafarer welfare program, which we will formally introduce in due course. We need to complete consultations with some stakeholders, 
Some elements are already in place, such as the help desk that can be reached via the email welfare at samsa.org.za. Welfare at samsa.org.za. The aim is to support our seafarers while at sea and to assist them as much as we can in fulfilling their care ambitions. Our colleagues at Saimi made a presentation about recruitment of seafarers, but we have this hypothesis uh, which still needs to be proven by research that our seafarers, they come back home quite early uh, when we expect them to go all the way and reach the higher ranks. And we are puzzled and we would like to know. So as SAMSA, we would like to provide support, obviously working with other stakeholders to, to support them while at sea. Uh, as we are aware, most organizations suffered financial setbacks in the last 14 months or so. SAMSA was also not spared. So some of the features of our program will not be available immediately. We will have to implement the program in stages. The highlights include a proposed page for CFERA welfare on our website. Uh, I saw Saimi also mentioned the same. Hence, I say we will be in interest. So we can see how we can work together. Uh, we're looking at a portal as well where we can interact with CFERAs. Uh, we're looking at also mentorship for cadets, uh, support for women at sea, uh, mental health support as well. Uh, we're looking at a walk-in and also an online facility. But uh, uh, some of these services are already on offer through our welfare officer, Nolundi Tubase. Our officials in the Western Cape are taking advantage of the walk-in service. She has also been dealing with many cases of abuse against our female seafarers, which is unfortunate. So as mentioned, in order to avoid the uh, a duplication some of the areas we will have to collaborate with other stakeholders with common interests and see if we can we can have one platform for our seafarers also as highlighted during last year's event uh, we need to firm up support when it comes to mental health issues which include cancer in conclusion uh, first i would like to thank our our counterpart in singapore the mpa who have always responded kindly when we need them to assist south africans in distress in that country uh, Mr. Aun Chia, kindly uh, pass our our gratitude. They have also been exemplary when it comes to to to, to issues of crew changes. I know they seem strict now, but uh, there are a lot of elements uh, that we can learn from from Singapore. And lastly, I call upon everyone with an interest in Cifera welfare to work together. It is only through our joint efforts that we can realize a fair future for Ciferas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ranzwabe. I think that was well said and well put. Um, I think what is actually very clear from, I mean, you know, from our panel's presentation, it is um, the need for all of us to work together and uh, to pull through to try and actually make sure that um, COVID actually does not really, I mean, you know, it, it really does not kill the industry. Uh, it is vital that we partner. It is vital that we collaborate to to make sure that um, this industry continues to flourish. And maybe to our seafarers, um, I do understand that you probably are you you not feeling like you know the country is behind you or that the entities are actually behind you. We are very much behind you and we are willing, we are doing everything in our powers to try and make sure that we support in going forward to make sure that you know that we are listening to your needs and to your cries. And before we actually, um, I know I'm noting there are hands that have actually been coming up. Um, can I just request um, all the hands that are actually up to, to say we will give a moment to try and actually answer questions. Um, at this point in time, can you just allow us to go through the program and then at some point we will try to actually bring in people that have questions. And with that, let me allow or let, let me introduce um, um, our last panel member, Mr. Mark Clausen. Mr. Mark Clausen is actually with the Mission for Seafarers Association. It is people like them that are actually there to make sure that uh, they somehow maintain sanity of our seafarers when they are in times of distress. And over to you, Mr. Clausen, and thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. Uh, thank you very much, Program Director. Uh, just a very good morning to our Honourable Minister, to uh, our guests, and especially to our seafarers. It's really an honour to be part of this forum. I'm just uh, requesting, please, is my presentation available? Uh, 
Okay, it, it, I mean, um, just to, uh, hold on. I think it just went missing uh, across uh, the lines. Can I ask you to present from your side? Would you be able to connect on your side? Or can you speak to it? I mean, I do apologize. I, I, okay, let me, let me rather, I'll speak to it rather. And then just for tech continuity, I'll uh, disable my camera. Okay, and no then, and then I'll, I'll commence. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, as the program director said, that uh, I work for the Mission to Seafarers. This is a global charity organization. I am currently based in the port of Richards Bay, South Africa, but I am part of a great chaplaincy team here in Richards Bay, together serving multinational, multicultural seafarers arriving from all around the world. Just to give a brief outline, on the life of seafarers. I know that there are many seafarers listening in and they will relate to this, but for those who do not know, just some seafarer situations that they subjected to uh, pre-COVID as well as now, since COVID is abandonment, piracy, shipwreck, very hard labor and harsh weather conditions, loneliness and isolation, mental stress, missing their families more than ever. In, still in some countries around the world, no shore leave and or repatriation. And as we are discovering more and more, the risk of contracting COVID. That is their life while out at sea. And in comes the, the mission societies, uh, just a uh, summary of the work that we do, I will highlight in detail next, but we offer friendship, we offer help, we offer support on the ship. We have seafarer centres, although now since COVID, uh, because of no shore leave, they're not allowed to frequent, but we do have seafarer centres that still offer uh, online services. Uh, we do have transport uh, that's still taking the online orders through to the ships. But for the chaplains, we offer counselling uh, and mediation during crisis or just on a daily uh, basis. We get involved with justice and welfare cases. Seafarers are really at the heart of everything that we do. Just in detail, Pre-COVID chaplaincy, uh, they, we did onboard ship visits where we, we would just chat to the guys, like I said, to befriend them. And if there are any issues, uh, emotional, spiritual, uh, psychological, uh, mental issues, we, uh, we are there, we are trained in counseling and we are able to support them, not only while on board, but even while they sail away we connect with them on social media. Something as well, pre-COVID hospital visitations, we do not only visit seafarers on board, but also when they land up in, in hospital for some, uh, with some unfortunate case, uh, we are there to uh, encourage them and to be there for them because they really, they feel, they feel lost, they're in a foreign country, they don't know who uh, to connect with, they don't know who to ask for help. And so that is where we come in. We also do hotel visits for those seafarers who are either being repatriated or those who are signing on and there's a delay in the vessel. We will go and meet them there. We'll, we'll already show them that they are not alone. There are people here that care for them. And then we do also offer spiritual assistance. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the seafarers, they will request a church service on board and we are able to meet their spiritual need as well. I want to focus more on the seafarer centers as well, again, pre-COVID, but I feel it's necessary to highlight uh, the seafarer centers and the services and the facilities that they offer because seafarers regard seafarer centers as a home away from home, a place that provides comfort, safety, and support. We offer free Wi-Fi. There are SIM cards and airtime. We have a parish uh, inside the, the, the center as well, where we can 
do church services and blessings. We have a restaurant shop, uh, some curios. There's a nice big seating area of TV entertainment. Um, and there's even a bar uh, for those who enjoy a drink. That really basically was pre-COVID. And now I want to share some of the challenges that we've been able to meet since then, since COVID. So initially at the onset of COVID, where we were not allowed to go to the vessels, um, we, we really thought about what we call digital chaplaincy. So it's to reach out to seafarers via social media in order to ensure that they know that there's somebody here for them, somebody that can listen to them, uh, to try and counsel them and try to help them to provide information uh, and assistance. The Mission to Seafarers, uh, along with ITMA, uh, initiated a program called Chat to a Chaplain, which is an online counseling platform. There are about 22 uh, to 25 trained online counselors, and we receive calls from seafarers as well as their families from all around the world. And uh, there's requests for, for example, uh, jobs, or there's requests for uh, repatriation, there's requests for uh, orders from, from the seafarers centre. Um, and recently, a lot of requests for vaccinations, which ports can do it. So we are able to feed that information through. And the seafarers really love this because like they always say to us that we are their link to the outside world. And that just means that they really, really trust us, uh, people that they know there's people there that care for them. Another initiative that we came up with because of COVID, because again, because of no shore leave, they couldn't get to the center uh, at first. They, they couldn't get a SIM card in order to phone their loved ones who they're missing. For those who know, uh, onboard satellite is, uh, is very expensive. They don't always have the funds for that. So, uh, so we received uh, a grant to, to get what we call MAFA units. So it's basically a, a router with the SIM card. And as a token of thanks and appreciation for all that seafarers do, their sacrifices um, and their hard work, their, uh, their lengthy contracts, just as a small token of appreciation, we offer them a MAFA unit and it's free, it's free of charge. And I tell you the, uh, the response from seafarers, they are so happy because they're able to uh, to see their loved ones, to be able to see their, their spouses and their children, and just to connect. And I tell you, uh, when you see the difference in their demeanor uh, from when you first come on to then offering a MAFA unit, um, uh, really, it's, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful to see. And seafarers really, really appreciate that. I just want to give a, a bit of a summary, please. Seafarers are humans at sea. They are not numbers on a crew list. We can give them a name, and we do. As Captain Mark Melly shared earlier on, they feel imprisoned and forgotten. Yet, they are vital to the global economic chain. Yes, so much has been done for them, and we are so grateful to governments and to shipping lines and to bodies, port authorities like SAMHSA. But there is still so much left wanting. And we only I say this because we, these are the testimonies that we receive from seafarers themselves. And my plea is that we continue to be their voice. And there are, there are forums like, for example, the Port Welfare Committee that certain ports have it have started, initiated, and Port Welfare Committees are basically uh, represented by various organizations. On our one specifically here in Richards Bay, we've got TNPA, we've got SAMHSA, which we're very fortunate to have. We've got SOSOA, we've got NSRI, we've got the local editor, 
uh, we, we've got chaplains, welfare organizations. It, it really, it's comprised of, of uh, various stakeholders and we all have one common purpose and that is to improve our services to seafarers. Because at the end of the day, what makes us happy is to see a seafarer happy. I want to give a big thank you. Uh, Mr. Sibusi Suranswabe mentioned earlier on that uh, SAMHSA is working uh, in close contact with uh, the likes of the Mission to Seafarers, uh, different chaplains around South Africa and around the world. And SAMHSA, principal officers, surveyors and welfare officers have been instrumental in helping seafarers with the legal issues or with the onboard safety issues. They've always been, whenever I contact them, they've always been helpful, immediate contact, uh, friendly. Uh, I really want to give a shout out to Sibu Siso. He's been really brilliant. So I want to thank you for this opportunity now today to raise the profile of our wonderful seafarers along with you, SAMHSA, and the Department of Transport. And I just want to end off by saying a very happy day of the seafarer to all seafarers around the world. Let's hashtag fair future for seafarers. Let's hashtag essential workers and let's hashtag thank you seafarers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Mark, for those wonderful words. But most importantly, thank you for the work that you do um, to make sure that um, the seafarers know that they are not alone and to make sure that to making sure that they know that somebody cares and somebody's there to be making sure that, uh, you know, they do not feel like they are giving their lives to what they do is actually waste. So we thank you very much for everything that you do. Um, and I know that I am speaking for everybody that is actually on this platform. But most importantly, I think it is only right, it is only correct for us to actually say thank you. And this is on behalf of all of us that are on this platform to the seafarers themselves that are connected and to those that actually are not connected. We know of stories that are heart wrenching of what you go through when you are out of, uh, I mean, at sea. And we are not taking anything lightly in terms of the work that you do. We appreciate you and we thank you. And as we end the pen, I mean the, 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 the presentations or the talks from our panel members, may I take this opportunity to just reflect on some of the, you know, the, 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 the presentations that have actually been uh, presented to us. And after that, I will then call upon um, my boss, the acting CEO, Ms. Tepiso, to then come back and actually take over as we come to the end of, um, of the session. So when we actually started the session this morning, um, our Honorable Minister reiterated that government, com government is committed to protecting the rights of the seafarers on the, sustainable, on the sustainable development of seafarers into the future. So that is a commitment that is actually coming from government and I mean, we know that, uh, you know, as much as it doesn't look like government is doing anything, we are committed to be making sure that life for the seafarers gets better. Minister um, Mr. Mtunzi Madia from um, the Department of Transport, um, the maritime section, also urged all partners to develop an, an effective strategy to ensure that seafarers are vaccinated as a matter of urgency. It is something that all countries, I think, are pushing to do. And we are realizing the need, and I think the country and the president are realizing the need to make sure that the vaccine actually reaches everybody out there, particularly you seafarers. Mr. Chu from Singapore shared with us the interventions from the government of his country designed to assist seafarers during this difficult time. Uh, many administrations could take a leaf from their best practices. And I think it is for that reason that we decided to invite Mr. Chu to be on this platform so that then he can share with us what Singapore is doing and we can equally learn and exchange ideas. Um, you, it's never too late to learn. There's always something that we can learn from both sides. And we do appreciate the partnership and we do appreciate your availability, Mr. Chu, 
for really actually taking the time to actually come and present to um, South Africa and to um, our minister and everybody that was on this platform. Uh, Mrs. Artman from Saini summarized that, that the cadetship and seafarer support programs are currently at, at, at Saini. Seafarers are encouraged to engage our partners and at Saimi to see how they can benefit from the programs available there. Please check with the SAMSA social, please check on the SAMSA social media platforms for contact details. But equally, I would imagine that the information is also available on the Saimi platform, on the Department of Transport platforms. So to everybody that is listening, please um, go through um, our, all our social medias. As we speak, I know that uh, we are trending and um, you are most welcome to actually send through your comments anything that you believe that would, might actually be of value to make sure that we improve and we get better in what we do. Um, Mr. Mbagaza from AMSO gave a comprehensive look at a 21st century employer and the support that they give to seafarers. And that would be, of course, Mr. Mbagaza from, uh, from AMSO. Again, we thank you, sir, for your, um, your time. We thank you for your, par I mean, for your partnership. We thank you for your willingness to always actually, I mean, hear us when we call upon yours, I mean, your, your, your company to come and actually uh, present um, in our sessions. Uh, Mr. Mike, uh, Captain Mike Melly reiterated the plea to prioritize the vaccination of seafarers and the treatment of seafarers at sea by governments where our seafarers travel to. I think um, from Captain Melly's um, plea, you could actually hear the passion as he was speaking, um, this is the man that has actually been in this industry starting from way back in 1977, I believe. Um, he loves what he does, and you can even hear it from when he speaks. Um, we, we, we will endeavor, Captain um, Mali, to, to do the best that we can. Uh, we know we will not always get it right, but that's why the likes of yourselves will always be there to give us a hard time to make sure that we deliver on promises that we, we have made. Um, Selinda Kutle Nyoka, our seafarer, thank you very much again, equally so to you, for equally bringing to light the seafarers that are actually on, you know, on and um, that are at sea, that are really having a difficult time, but equally just also not painting a, a picture that is bloom, uh, that is, you know, the dark and faded, that, I mean, it's an all doom and gloom. There's hope, and we want to encourage all young people to actually just really look at what are the opportunities that are within this industry. And we thank you for your time and for making it possible. To my colleague, Mr. Ranzwabe, I think he did highlight in terms of the commitment that SAMSA is actually making to ensuring that um, we are not uh, listening or we are not doing what we need to be doing to make sure that the seafarers are there um, they still actually are treated fairly and they do actually get to, to know that they are appreciated. Um, with those few words, let me take this opportunity to thank you all, but most importantly, let me thank our Honourable Minister for actually, pre I mean, making uh, the time to actually